You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is episode 33, and I'm your host, Brian McClanahan, and this episode covers the week of June 27th to July 1st, 2016. Glad to have you back. We have a lot of great information to talk about on this particular uh, podcast. Of course, we had a monumental event take place last week uh, that took place after uh, we had already recorded the podcast, so uh, we'll talk about that. We had a couple articles about that event, but first I want to remind you that our next Abbeville Institute event is coming up August 13th, 2016. It's a Saturday from 10 to 3 in Atlanta, Georgia. The topic is nullification, and we're going to discuss what that means for the United States. Of course, now in the context of Brexit, uh, this is a big issue. People are talking about self-determination and local rule and all these type of things. So nullification is part of that. So we'd love to have you come out. We have a lot of great speakers, uh, a couple of uh, well-known uh, lawyers are going to be there. Uh, Jeff Atticott, who I just actually heard the other day on uh, on the radio, on the Joe Pag show, I believe it was, and um, also uh, Kent Masterson Brown, who uh, has argued before the Supreme Court. We also have a retired judge from Alabama, Judge Rusty Johnston, um, and uh, he's going to be talking about what the court system can do to resist unconstitutional federal laws, the state court system, not the federal court system. Uh, yours truly will be there. Also, Don Livingston and Mike Meharry from the 10th Amendment Center is going to talk about current nullification efforts and what's going on in the states today, what the states are doing to uh, resist unconstitutional federal legislation. So we have a lot of good talks, and um, it will be, I, I think, a, a, a good time and well worth your time to attend. Information is available on our website, so go on over and check that out under events, uh, and uh, we'd love to see you there. The cost of the conference does include your uh, midday meal. If you're at the uh, summer school, that's your dinner, um, or some people call that your lunch. So uh, come on out and check that out. We've, uh, we've also uh, want to emphasize that the Abbeville Institute, this podcast, the website, all the things that we do, exist on your generous contributions alone, so please consider a tax-deductible contribution to the Abbeville Institute. Uh, we, do, uh, we do appreciate your support. If you can't come to the conferences, if you can't do things like that, consider uh, helping us out and uh, make a contribution online. Also, information on that is available. And like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, do those type of things. Join our uh, email list. We send one out once a week. Uh, highlighting the material for the week, and also highlighting an article or, uh, that we've published on the website. So uh, join that. You also get a free ebook for signing up for our email. So go ahead and do all those great things, and uh, help us out here at the at the Abbeville Institute. Help us preserve and explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. Okay, so let's talk about the articles for the week. First two had to deal with uh, this issue of Brexit. So a monumental event last week. Uh, the people of Great Britain decided in a referendum to withdraw from the European Union. Now, this is, uh, this is huge because what it says is that uh, the people of Great Britain did not want to be part of a, what was becoming a single European government. In fact, the, the amazing thing about that is that shortly after the vote was taken on, on Brexit, there was a secret memo revealed that by the polls that showed that there was an attempt to create a European super state where the borders would disappear and Germany would be at the head of that. Now, people are shocked, oh my gosh, you know, because they don't, they don't remember, most people don't, don't remember or understand or know European history. So there was a time about a thousand years ago, and even before that, when you look at the Roman Empire, but even in, in uh, post-Roman history, there was a time when France and Germany were a super state under the rule of Charlemagne. And so one of the reasons why these two areas are in conflict oftentimes is because of Alsace and Lorraine, which was fought over by Charlemagne's uh, grandsons, 
when they divided the empire out, and you had the, essentially the creation of Frankland, you know, West Frankland and East Frankland. So there was a time when these states were joined together. Now, that doesn't mean it should happen again uh, when you start. Basically, you're creating another European empire at that point. And the Germans have long tried, and the French have long tried to, um, to control territory. The Germans would love to be in control of France. Uh, you know, this is what Hitler wanted to do in the Third Reich. So this is rather interesting that there's some type of discussion of creating a European superstate, a borderless superstate at some point. But Great Britain has said, hey, you can do that all you want. We're out. And um, now there's discussion of other states leaving the European Union. And so this is this is becoming a very big deal. And the, the interesting thing about all this, of course, is that it was done through popular referendum. It was put to a vote, and the people said, we're going to leave. Now, it was a close vote. You know, it was 52 to 48, I think, was the final tally. But it shows that self-determination may be the political ideology of the 21st century. Uh, and Don Livingston, of course, the president of the Institute, has said before, how do we know that uh, in, in some of his writings, people have said, well, this, this idea of self-determination, of nullification, of secession, these things are archaic, they're out of date. And he said, well, the 21st, they're not a 21st century idea, but the 21st century is just getting underway, and the Brexit vote has clearly shown that this may be the idea of the 21st century, that perhaps, and we'll talk about this in his piece, perhaps these notions of superstates are a 19th century idea that centralization is old and outdated. So the first piece we ran is The Brits Believe in Secession After All by Brad Green. Um, and it's a very short little piece, and he talks about how uh, it relates this to the South. Um, how does this relate to Southern history? And this has been a big question. In fact, all over social media, people were saying, well, is the, is the European Union going to send in the troops and keep Great Britain in the Union? Uh, that's what Lincoln would have done. So hopefully people won't listen to Lincoln They'll, uh, they'll follow the, the uh, great process of self-determination of people deciding for themselves what government they want to live under. Now, of course, that immediately created rebuke. No, you can't say that. The South and, and, uh, and Great Britain are two different things. Uh, because, And I've even seen people say this, well, that, you know, the, the European Union had uh, stipulations in its constitution that the, that the states can leave through a referendum. Then they have to have a negotiated settlement. There's nothing like that in the Constitution. Well, this is true. There's nothing in the Constitution that says, uh, by this mechanism, states can leave the Union. But I point, and many people have pointed to the fact that secession was openly discussed in the United States. First of all, one of the great reasons, one of the great fears that we had the Constitution in the first place was disunion. People believed that secession was, was highly possible. So they wanted to create a, a stronger union, not to prevent secession, but to ensure that the union would stay together. And if you look at a lot of the documents that are coming out of 1787 in the United States and discussing secession, discussing the fear of disunion, it's quite clear that the founding generation thought it was entirely possible. And then the fact that, you know, if a state didn't ratify the Constitution, what was their status in the Union? Well, they wouldn't have been in the Union any longer. They would have been an independent republic, and you had North Carolina and Rhode Island have that status for a time. But then even after you have the Constitution ratified, in 1794, you have an open discussion of secession by northern leaders. In 1798, you have the Virginia-Kentucky resolutions, which were not secession pieces. I mean, the, the idea of nullification is to preserve the Union. But you had people saying, well, this is a silly idea. If you don't like what's going on in the Union, just leave. Uh, you know, don't, don't nullify, just secede. Uh, and then you have, uh, of course, Thomas Jefferson, elected in 1800. And 1801, there is an open discussion about secession in 1800 during the process by which Jefferson is elected. New England Federalists are talking about leaving the Union should Jefferson be elected. And Jefferson himself said in his inaugural address, his first inaugural address, look, if there's people that are in favor of leaving the Union, uh, let's not coerce them. Uh, and so he mentioned that. Uh, and then, of course, 1803, after the Louisiana Purchase, there's an open discussion of secession. Uh, and then during the Hartford Convention, or the War of 1812, 1812 to 1815, there are people in New England talking about leaving. So these are all members of the founding generation. None of these people, uh, they might have been a very close 
generation behind the founding generation, born just a little bit too late to be considered part of the founding generation itself. But they're not that often that, se- well, I mean, War of 1812, you're getting that second generation. But the leaders of the secession movements were often members of the founding generation. So they understood that uh, secession was entirely possible, that it wasn't illegal because it's the, the Constitution has enumerated powers. One of those enumerated powers is not forcing a state to stay in the Union. So, and then, of course, you have secession discussed in the 1830s in the South and then in the 1840s in the North with the abolitionists and then uh, 1850s in the South again. Then finally it happens in 1860 and 61. But in all these cases, uh, until 1860, 61, nobody talked about sending in the army to prevent secession. That was a later development. And so Bradley Green is essentially saying, look, I mean, you can compare the Confederate states with this with this movement in Britain as a secession movement. Uh, and he brings up the fact that the, the southern states peacefully seceded from the United States. Uh, he says this is not a U.S. version of the French Revolution. In reality, he says it's not a revolution at all. The southern states, he says, simply and peaceably said goodbye. They drafted a constitution. They formed a congress. And they chose a capital. Uh, So it's it's amazing to me how people look at the act of secession in the U.S. differently. That, well, it's okay for the British because they had a referendum. Well, what a lot of people don't realize is that the secession conventions were democratically elected. It wasn't a cabal of people that said, we're out. And they led a coup in the South. It wasn't covert, undercover. People didn't know what was happening. It was completely out in the open. There were elections held, conventions were called, and people voted, delegates voted to secede, and crushing majorities. So this was the will of the people of the South to leave the Union. But yet, it wasn't allowed to happen. So in Great Britain, you have the will of the the British people to leave the European Union. And we'll see what happens. There's already some discussion about having a second referendum to see if it's going to uh, happen at all. And some people are saying they don't believe it's going to happen, that it'll be blocked somehow. We'll see uh, if uh, if the Brits are allowed to leave the European Union or if this actually comes to fruition. Um, Nigel Farage is already saying, uh, well, let's let's do it quickly. Let's get out quickly because uh, this is the will of the people now, and we don't need to have another referendum. We need to leave. And this is peaceful. Let's have peaceful trade with, with the rest of Europe. Let's, we just want to, to forge our own destiny when it comes to our own laws. So on Tuesday, we ran a piece by Dr. Livingston himself, Brexit Dividing the Indivisible. And this is a much more philosophical treatise on what the modern state means. And he brings up some history of states, of uh, the creation of, of states and the idea of the modern state nation state. And he mentions the fact that the medieval world, and he says a quote, the medieval world was composed of thousands of independent political units, kings, principalities, free cities, dukedoms, the papacy, bishoprics, bishoprics, republics. And the largest, one of the largest uh, cities was London with only a population of only about 70,000. Most of the cities had less than 10,000 people. Uh, most of these cities had 60,000 people or less. So we think in today, you know, these highly centralized world, but he says in the medieval world, it was highly decentralized. And he says it's true that these small states often had wars with each other, but they were generally, generally limited. Um, and they, uh, they weren't the totalitarian tyrannies of modern monster states, such as Germany, Russia, Italy, France, Britain, and the United States. Uh, And the power in these principalities and other things was limited. And it wasn't until the French Republic that you have the emergence of the state to declare itself indivisible. That's a modern conception. And then he says, which is entirely true, European states resisted by imitating the worst features of French centralization, as Lincoln and the Republican Party did as well. Lincoln's invasion of the South is judged by some historians to be the first modern war. That is the first in which, as a matter of policy, war turned on civilians. 
Now, you can, I mean, looking at military history, there were wars before that. You know, the Hundred Years' War, for example, was horrible in its relation with civilians and what happened to civilian populations. And you go back to ancient republics and you find wars on civilian populations. I mean, the burning of Troy, for example, was a war on civilian populations. And you saw this in the Greek republics, but a lot of that became, a lot of that was part of a, of a move to centralize. If you look at the Athenian League, for example, uh, you know, the Athenian Empire, uh, they would forcibly uh, keep states within their, their empire by slaughtering populations, so civilian populations. So, but eventually rules developed where uh, in the, moving into the early modern period in European history where civilians were left alone. And it's only the Crimean War, you could probably say, was the first modern war in terms of where uh, weaponry were outstripping strategy and tactics. But then you look at the Civil War and um, uh, Lincoln's invasion of the South and how that really becomes when you look at total war on the South. And people, I mean, those people quibble with that. Well, it wasn't really total war. Uh, when you look at the attack on civilian populations, that that creates some type of new phenomenon, and the entire infrastructure and everything else is destroyed. You move forward in time, you get to World War One and World War Two, and that becomes part of it. And so he starts talking about the fact that monster European states took to conquering the world, and so this creates problems because they're allergic, as he says, they're allergic to each other. And so then you have World War I and World War II and the Cold War. Um, and he says, clearly, the legacy of the modern state has not been peace and prosperity, but war and totalitarian regimes. It is true that prosperity has existed in modern states, but that is, for the most part, in spite of the modern state, not because of it. The massive, this massive concentration of power was possible because each state was individual, indivisible. That is, no independent social authority, which happened to survive within it, was capable of limiting its power by leaving. Yet there was no limit to the modern state's size. It could expand, but could not be divided. And he says, clearly enough, the sacred bonds of marriage can be broken and the parties separate, but not the sacred bond of state indivisibility. But he mentions that the twilight of the modern state seems to be setting. And so you've had this movement since the French Revolution. I think, clearly, the French Revolution really was a turning point in Western civilization. Everything that we have today, all the things that are going on in the world, whether it's social and political movements, all these things are a byproduct of the French Revolution. Um, the, what the French Revolution did was unleash nationalism on Europe. And that created, helped create the modern nation state. Now, we can say that's a good thing or a bad thing. Even Britain is probably too big. The Scots don't really want to be part of Britain. Maybe the Welsh don't either. The Irish certainly didn't. So uh, perhaps Britain needs to be divided even further and go back to being England uh, and Scotland. Uh, so you, you have this, this idea of you know, the nation state and what it means and what it is. Uh, and so he's saying that uh, you know, perhaps we're coming to a point where this secession, so to speak, is becoming the idea of the 21st century. He says, of course, anarchy could follow secession, but it rarely does. And see, indeed, secession usually invigorates the seceding party as well as the regime from, from, which, from which it withdrew. America's secession taught Britain some good lessons and strengthened its identity and place in the world. In the history of modern state is the violence needed to, suppre to suppress secession that yields anarchy, the anarchy of civil war. So it's interesting, he says, you know, Lincoln, uh, he says, once free of the archaic philosoph philosophic superstition of indivisibility, we can view the South secession in a new light. Southern states called conventions and their sovereign people to vote up or down an ordinance of secession, the same convention that authorized entrance into the Union. The southern states recalled their senators and representatives and sent commissioners to Washington to negotiate the terms of peaceful separation. Lincoln refused to see them, wrapping himself in the modern myth of state indivisibility. Lord Acton at the time called Lincoln's invasion an awful crime. Americans have yet to confront the unpleasant truth of Acton's judgment. The reason they have not is that for over a century our nationalist historians have written history in such a way as to make it difficult to confront it. 
They have written history this way because the structure of their inquiry and research is constrained and guided by the control belief of indivisibility. That belief is no longer credible, credible, not because it has been refuted, he says it was several times by Althusius, for example, and David Hume, but for the more devastating reason that it is becoming boring. So it's a great, great piece about a philosophical position on this idea of self-determination. And then on Wednesday, we followed up with a Q&A from uh, Clyde Wilson on nullification, which is uh, ran this because we have our conference coming up on the topic, and so we're trying to put some pieces up about the idea. And um, the question is a series of questions, and then Clyde answers. The first question, what can I read that can give me a serious overview of the true impact of the tariffs of 1828 and 1832 on South Carolina? And Clyde answers very simply, I think the question of the impact of the protective tariff on South Carolina is the wrong question to ask. He actually says it's a diversionary tactic. The questions he said we should ask about that period are, was the protective tariff just? Was it good policy? And last and most importantly, was it constitutional? And he says no to all these questions. These things are true. So he goes into the tariff and starts discussing the history of the tariff. But... uh, the important question in this, do you believe nullification would have, would have to involve convening a special convention of the people, or could it conceivably be carried out by a state legislature? And he points out that um, the best way to do this is through a convention of the people, not through your state legislature, but call a convention. And my particular talk in Atlanta is going to be on that topic. Um uh, And he mentions that the South Carolina Constitution at the time said that a convention could only be called by a three-fourths majority of both houses of the legislature, and South Carolina wanted to make it clear that that the act was a high constitutional one based on the primary sovereignty of the people of the state of South Carolina. So the Virginia-Kentucky resolutions were carried out through the legislatures of those states. But Clyde is saying, look, what, what needs to really be done is a convention of the people, almost like you'd be amending the Constitution. But that's what really needs to be done. And so I think that's the important thing. You can read through this particular piece. Uh, and he, he debunks some myths about the Virginia-Kentucky resolutions. He, he talks about the tariff, whether it was constitutional or not. It's a great little, little Q&A, and it sets up what we're going to be discussing in Atlanta on August 13th. So, we, again, we hope you come out to that, but um, these pieces that we've run on nullification are very good for answering some questions about the idea and what states can do. And th- the idea that nullification is disunion, he also, also mentions that nullification was used as a, as a negative term, that interposition was actually what was happening here. Uh, the fact is that these movements are pro-union. I mean, you have a law that's passed, that's blatantly unconstitutional, and the states are, are just saying, uh, you know, wait a second here. We're going to stay in the union, but this law is unconstitutional, and we want to emphasize that fact, and we're just not going to follow it in our state. You can do what you want in your state, but it's null and void in our state. And I think that's, and it's a union position. They're not saying we're, we're not leaving the union. Uh, we're just not following this unconstitutional law in our state. So it's important to realize that nullification or interposition, these are principles that date back to the founding period, essentially. And uh, and if you look at the ratification debates of the Constitution, my favorite quote, and I've said it over and over again, comes from Roger Sherman of Connecticut when he was asked about uh, you know what would happen if the general government abused its power. Well, then he said the states would be powerful enough to check it. Well, what does that mean? If the states are going to be powerful enough to check it, how are they going to check it? And if you look at the response of the states and over time through the, for the founding period, they simply thought that the states would be able to essentially not follow unconstitutional legislation. An unconstitutional law is no law. That, that position was actually argued by people like Alexander Hamilton. Now, we can question Hamilton's honesty in that taking that position. He knew what he was doing when he said those things because he knew that People believed the states had to have ultimate authority in this government. Of course, he didn't believe that himself. But 
so it's important to understand this idea of state interposition. All right. Our piece on Thursday uh, was uh, is written by John Shelton Reed. It's an interesting piece on um, Southern culture, and the title of the piece is Instant Grits and Plastic Wrap Crackers, Southern Cultural and Regional Development. This was actually published in a book um, edited by Lewis Rubin, Jr. in 1979. So uh, John Shelton Reed is a sociologist, and he studies Southern culture, and one thing he mentions that's in this essay, it's, it's a really interesting essay because he's talking about the New South in 1979 and how Atlanta is trying to be Tokyo and, and Charlotte's trying to be Atlanta and Columbia, South Carolina is trying to be Charlotte in 1979 and how the South is moving into this acceptance of the modern world and what that means for Southern culture. And if you look around at the South, you'll see that the South has pretty much accepted Modernity, you know, you have fast food chains, you have uh, shopping centers, uh, and you have uh, banking institutions more important than, than the cotton trade. You know, Wall Street is more important than, uh, than Main Street, so to speak. Um, you've lost this traditional southern economy of agriculture. I mean, there, the South still has more farms than other parts of the country, save the West. I mean, you have more farms here and people engage in that type of, of activity. But Southerners are accepting. You know, in, in where I live, uh, it used to be a mill town, which was an industrial center, and it was one of the few industrial centers in the South. But now it's banking and insurance that are the major industries. And so that's that's a complete development, uh, you know, modern development. I mean, this is what the North does. They do banking and insurance. And here in the South, now it's banking and insurance. Uh, also a very large military installation. So you have the South moving in a new direction. Automobile manufacturing now is popular in the South. So the South is moving away from the backbone of what made it the South for a long period of time, and that's agriculture. And you look at it, and I remember uh, you know, taking a, a New South course in graduate school, and uh, you know, the professor there thought that agrarianism was too romantic, it was too sentimental, that it was a hard life that nobody wanted, and that's why they accepted industrialization, because it led to more prosperity, easier living, this type of thing. And I think there's something to that. Uh, you know, living on the farm is hard. It's not easy. Uh, you know, people do have a romantic view of it, but it is a hard life. Now, you have independence in that life, but your standard of living may not be as great in terms of your material comforts. Uh, you are tied into the rain and the, and the weather and other things, and so that can lead to a, a difficult financial situation. So it's not easy. Of course, more and more people are thinking about the agrarian tradition, what they can do, uh, even just adopting parts of it, maybe not necessarily living off the land or uh, you know, living entirely as a farmer, but having a small farm at your house, uh, you know, trying to grow some of your own food, trying to gain financial independence, these type of things that, that are interesting. And what this particular piece talks about is cultural resistance to modernity that still exists in the South. And one thing uh, Dr. Reed points out is religion. In 1979, the South was still primarily the Bible Belt, and that still is true today. You still find that in the South. Uh, and so the South is still much more interested in religion, particularly you know Protestantism, than any other part of the country. And uh, that does have an impact on Southern culture. The South is more generous than any other part of the, any other region of the country. Even though the South, uh, you know, the incomes, as he mentions, are, are are equalizing a little bit, but Southerners, even even Southerners without much money, still give more to charity than any other part of the country. Uh, you look at charitable do donations and contributions in the North; they're basically zero in many areas. But in the South, because of this belief in Christianity, and at least giving to your church, uh, tithing to your church, maybe 10% of your income or whatever it is, whatever people want to do, they believe that that's part of their duty in life is to be a Christian society and help people that are worse off than you and give thanks for the, for the things that you have. And so he points out in 1979 the South was still this way, and I think in 2016 the South is still primarily more uh, more interested in Christianity than any other part of the country. And this has nothing to do with race. It's across racial divides. You know, white and black Southerners, 
Both attend church in high numbers, higher numbers than other parts of the country. Uh, it has nothing to do with uh, socioeconomics. Uh, he mentions that actually in some parts of the country, you know, poor people tend to go to church more than, than uh, white-collar workers, whereas in the South it's the exact opposite. Uh, you know, affluent Southerners tend to go to church more than uh, less affluent Southerners. So um, it's interesting how, uh, you know, he says the South takes religion seriously. So uh, that's one thing that the South can offer for modern society. He says maybe modern society can learn from that, that Christian charity... And, and it's interesting how, you know, we ha- a lot of people have a negative view of Christianity, but Christianity is what allows Western civilization to exist. If you look at other major uh, religions in the world, they're nowhere near as tolerant as Christianity. Uh, and so Christianity allows Western civilization to thrive. It allows all the things that, you know, Christians do say that these things are immoral, but at the end of the day, Christians tolerate that whereas other religions don't. And so it's that Christian charity, that Christian tolerance, loving your neighbor, uh, hating the sin but loving the neighbor, uh, loving the person. That's Christian charity, seeing the person that needs help and you help them out, not through government intervention, but through your own pocket. Uh, And I think that's that's the thing that, People do recognize in the South, in real Southern communities, where you still have community, and that's actually the second part of this piece, that the South still believes in community more than any other part of the country. Uh, and there's a, he has an interesting paragraph on this. He says, quote, Once again, we can find outcroppings of this characteristic scattered here and there in an American public opinion poll data. For instance, when asked... When asked what man that you have heard or read about living anywhere in the world today, they, meaning Southerners, or these people most admire, Southerners are twice as likely as non-Southern Americans to name a relative or some local notable. He said nearly a quarter do so, despite the polling organization's obvious attempt to discourage such responses. When asked where they would live if they could live anywhere they wanted, Southerners are more likely and have been since the question was first asked in 1939 to say right here. When asked to name the best American state, Southerners name their own. Almost 90% of North Carolinians do so, for an extreme example, compared to less than half of the residents of Massachusetts. Asked where they would like to, a son to go to college if expense were no problem, only New Englanders are more likely than Southerners to name a school in their own region. Two-thirds of Southerners, he said, did so the last time the question was asked, despite the poor national reputation of Southern schools. Only 3% of non-Southerners chose Southern schools. And he says, within the Southern population, the degree of localism is lowest among urban groups. So it's, it's again, this rural-urban split. People in the South that live in rural areas love their areas. I mean, it's been pointed out over and over again. You know, Southerners sing about, uh, you know, Georgia on my mind and Sweet Home Alabama and these great odes, you know, Carolina, I remember you, these great odes to the South that cut across, again, racial divide. You you do have some songs in the North that sing about, you know, their place where they're from. Some of them are actually from the Midwest where you had a lot of Southerners settle and they, and they love that, uh, that, you know, lifestyle there. But uh, you don't find too many people singing about, you know, sweet home Boston, uh, you know, uh, or, um, you know, you do have people singing about New York, but New York has always been a little different. Um, you just don't find that regional identity as much in the North as you do in the South. People love the South. They love being Southern. There's, there's an identity to it. So if people still identify as Southern, and that's what he's getting into here. And he cl- concludes the piece by saying, This essay began with some questions one Southerner was asking 50 years ago. At about the same time, another Southerner, John Crow Ransom, advised the South to accept industrialism but with a very bad grace and maintain a good deal of her traditional philosophy. We can see now that Ransom's implied dichotomy was probably a false one. The South has accepted, indeed sought, industrialism wholeheartedly, but some at least of her traditional philosophy remains. And these aspects of the region's culture may yet modify the development of the South. 
So it's important to point out that the South, there still are parts of the Southern tradition that are evident um, and worthwhile. What can the South offer to America? Maybe it is that localism. Think locally, act locally. Maybe that's it, that the South can say, this would be good for America. Having a firm commitment to Christianity would be good for America. What is, ex- what is valuable in the Southern tradition? Well, Reed is saying, simply put, localism and religion. Those are things that the South can offer to America that make sense, that could help make modern America prosper and thrive. That maybe what we need to do is focus more on ourselves rather than worry about what everybody in some other state or locality are doing. And if we do that, perhaps we could have a happier people. If we love the land, if we love God, if we do those things, maybe that creates a happier people. Uh, you know, one of the things, one of the critiques always of industrialization has been the lack of humanity in it. It's, it's an inhumane system. It's People lose their identity. People, people become robots. They become a number in an industrial process, whereas Southerners still believe in people. And I think that's something else that you know, Southerners offer. They believe in people. And so what can the South offer? It's not just political. You know, We talk about secession and nullification. That's actually localism. But what about culture? What, what, what part of culture can the South offer? And uh, maybe that's Christianity. Maybe that's the love of man, of humanity. It's not saying Southerners are perfect in this regard. No one ever would say that. And there's lots of bad people in the South, just like anywhere else. But the dominant culture is one of respect your fellow man and show Christian charity. And I think that's maybe, I mean, you could say maybe that's disappearing in the South. This was written in 1979, so, you know, now almost 30 years ago. Uh, you know, almost 40 years ago, excuse me. Uh, and so uh, it's um, maybe that's disappeared in 40 years. Uh, but maybe it hasn't yet. Maybe it hasn't yet. All right, finally, uh, the last piece of the week on Friday, a little different change of pace written by John Devaney, the South land of heavyweight boxing champions. And so he brings out, brings up the fact that boxing, of course, we just had the death of Muhammad Ali, so uh, you know that was all over the news for a while. And so he wrote a little piece about boxing. And uh, he points out the fact that the South really didn't invent anything that has to do with our modern conception of athletics. These were all invented in the North. Baseball, football, basketball. Uh, but he points out that all the, greatest, <laughs> all the greatest players in these particular sports are Southerners. Uh, now, he, one thing I would quibble with John on, uh, he says the top baseball player is Ty Cobb. I would have to say the top baseball player was Babe Ruth. Uh, and so Babe Ruth, of course, was from Baltimore, which is a southern city. Uh, or you might even say, you know, Willie Mays. Willie Mays was from the south. Maybe Hank Aaron, who's from the south. So, I mean, your best baseball players have been in the United States from the south. The top basketball player from the south and Michael Jordan, the top football player from the south, Jim Brown. Uh, but he mentions the boxing. Now, uh, John is, um, if anyone that knows John knows that he really likes wrestling and boxing. And he mentions that uh, not, the South is not really a place where people say, oh, yeah, boxing champions come from the South. But he points out it's true. Uh, as you move forward, uh, you have the some of the best boxing champions of all are from the South. I mean, Muhammad Ali is from the South. Uh, but he points out, you know, Marvin Hart of Louisville was from the South. Jack Johnson of Galveston, Texas, from the South. Um, and these people um, uh, really defined what it meant for the, for the boxing world. Um, Joe Lewis uh, was from Alabama. And then you move into a different, you move forward in time, and then you start seeing just about Everyone that was a great boxing champion came from the South. Floyd Patterson of North Carolina, Sonny Liston from Arkansas, Muhammad Ali from Kentucky, Ernie Terrell from Mississippi, Jimmy Ellis from Kentucky, Joe Frazier from South Carolina, George Foreman from Texas. Uh, and even some of, the, some of the contenders, Buster Mathis, Ernie Shavers, uh, 
So some of these people, uh, you know, some of the greatest names in boxing were from the South. And so you, when you start looking at American culture, you can't say the South invented it all. And when you look at modern American culture, athletics, professional athletics, have a, have a hold on a modern American culture. People love football, and they love basketball, and they love baseball. Uh, they love hockey. Even hockey is becoming popular in the South and some parts of the South. You know, ice hockey, which... <laughs> which is kind of funny because, you know, when they're still playing ice hockey when it's 90 degrees outside in the South. But, uh, you know, people love, uh, love their professional athletics and their college. I mean, look, football in the South, you know, it's, it's college. And that, that has to do with localism, the priests we just talked about. People are identify. The reason, one of the reasons why people identify with Southern schools is because of their football teams. You know, uh, they want their kids to go to Alabama or Auburn. They want their kid to go to Clemson or South Carolina because of the football team. They want their kid to go to North Carolina or, or Florida or uh, Texas or Oklahoma or Miss, Ole Miss. They want their kids or Mississippi State. They want their kids to go there because of the football team or Tennessee. So they identify that regionalism, and, and you hear it when you li- if, if, if anyone has ever lived in the South and you listen to your sports talk show stations, you know, the local ones in particular, the, the ones that cover just the South. The term we is used all the time. You know, we got to get out there on Saturday and beat uh, whatever the team they're playing. And, and our guys are, you know, uh, you know they, they identify as personal. It's personal. Uh, you don't hear that as much with your professional teams, but there's a personal attachment. Uh, people are wounded, personally wounded, when their team is, is defeated or when, uh, you know, somebody says something disparaging about their team. Because they identify with that. It's not just the team. It's their state. It's their locality. That's, it's hitting them right in the heart. So they're wounded by it. But, uh, you know, the South has brought to American culture. And, in fact, you know, as, as I've said before, the South is America. Southern culture is, is American culture in many ways. It's what we think about it. Professional athletics, our food, religion, all these things are so much influenced by the South. Even, you know, the old heroes of America, Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett, you know, George Rogers Clark. Uh, and then if you look at Western, the West, uh, which has become, you know, kind of popular to study the West now again, but a lot of those people are Southern that you're looking at there that uh, define the West. And so it's, um, it's really important to understand uh, how how the South, again, across racial lines, the people that uh, John are talking about here, a lot of them are black, you know, across racial lines, uh, music, you know, blues, jazz, country, these things are all Southern inventions. And so it's important to understand that when you look at Southern culture and how important it has been in influencing American culture. And uh, we could talk about politics all day and how important the South has been in influence politics, even in the 20th century. Not always for the good, but uh, it definitely has been important moving forward. So the thing that you can get out of this particular week and looking at Brexit and then looking at the culture we talked about, the South is America. And one of the things you can learn from Brexit is that self-determination, the local, is very important. Localism, Christianity, these things matter in the South, and they should matter. And that's something we should always, we should always have pride in where we're from. Focus on your family first. Then focus on your local community, then your state, then the central government. And if we do that, if we start taking that idea and that position, things can improve quite rapidly in the United States. And it'll give you a much more positive outlook on the world. It's very easy to get dragged down by what's happening around you, things you can't control. But you can control the local. More than anything else, you can control that local. And if we just start thinking about it in that way, If people just started thinking, look, I don't really care what happens in California. I only care what happens in my state or my locality. Um, I think that people would be a lot happier. Until next time, good day. (laughs) 